Okay, so. Um, opportunities on the high street. Okay. Oops, sorry. Right, so uh, my name is Rajan Bhattacharya. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, opportunities on the high street. I started off investing uh, in property in 1990, um, and I started in commercial property in 2001. Uh, I find it a lot easier than residential property for many reasons. Uh, it's much easier dealing with uh, these sort of tenants than it is the likes of uh, your typical people who occupy HMOs, for instance. Um, about 70% of our rent roll is still residential, but um, the thing about the commercial rent roll is it's a lot less effort, if you like, to, to manage. Um, so I've been doing this since 1990. I did a management consulting career, went full-time in property in 2001, um, did a lot of flat conversions, um, converting large buildings into flats uh, from 2001 onwards, mainly in London. Um, and in the early 2000s, I found that uh, yields weren't that great in London. Uh, I didn't want to go up north, that wasn't really my style, I wanted to stay in the London area and what I found was that to preserve my yields um, it, it made sense to do commercial to residential conversions or conversions of mixed use buildings um, into residential use because I found the blended yields on those buildings were far better. Uh, as a result I got into commercial conversions quite early um, I did my first uh, retail to resi conversion in 2006, which was under full planning permission, um, and it only became permitted development later on in 2013. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, you may have seen me on this uh, show that's appearing on Sky, uh, Property Elevator. It's a pitch show where people come on, it's a bit like Shark Tank and Dragon's Den, people come on and pitch their projects. Um, on the show and uh, there are five of us angels and we um, compete to finance some of the good ones. Uh, that's airing on Sky in, in the autumn and also going to be on our YouTube channel. Uh, I funded a couple of deals on this uh, on series uh, two, some of which are commercial to resi conversions but more on that later on. Um, uh, I'm on YouTube as well, some of the stuff I'll breeze through you will find on YouTube uh, do subscribe to the channel, got some 25,000 subscribers. And one of the videos that specifically relates to this talk is my five golden rules for finding opportunity on the high street. Now, I think the death of the high street has been a little bit overrated and overdone. The media always likes to focus on the bad news. And it is very true that shops are shutting down. It is mainly shops or businesses where um, the business models were zombies, basically. They were just plodding along and um, this COVID shutdown era has been the final straw, uh, usually because the business model has been completely replaced by a different way of doing stuff, uh, internet and the like. As a result, we have a situation now where there's a massive oversupply of both office property and retail property. And it's coupled with this massive opportunity that the government's thrown at us to allow us to repurpose these buildings into alternative uses. Now, a lot has been made of repurposing commercial buildings into alternative uses such as residential, but there's huge rights now to repurpose office, sorry, commercial buildings into other commercial uses. Now this um, new E-class um, permitted, uh, sorry, uh, you, this commercial property usage class E has been a game changer. Uh, previously, um, every type of retail premises has been under separate usage class. So you had A1 shops covering things like estate, uh, um, news agents, for example, or grocery stores. A2 shops were things like estate agents or travel agents or insurance brokers. A3 were things like restaurants. B1 was, was for office. A D1 was for, say, a dentist surgery. But if you wanted to make a former dentist surgery into a, um, a retail store, you'd have to go through full planning permission. And this was a right pain because it gave, it meant that property owners, property landlords had amazing amount of inflexibility in what to do with their property. Um, one of my um, students has just let a property, an A1 property to a restaurant. And he had to go through 
uh, about a nine month process um, because it was a former A1 store and um, the people that wanted it wanted to open up as a Chinese restaurant. They had to go through a full planning process. That planning process was re rejected for change of use. Then they went to appeal um, and the appeal was decided two weeks before um, the 1st of September. And basically it was granted an appeal. But on 1st of September, you no longer, from 1st of September onwards, you no longer need to go through all of that palaver. If you as a property owner want to change from an A1, something like a news agent and put a restaurant in there, um, you can do so. If you have a former GP's practice and you've got a convenience store that wants to operate in there, you can do so. You can do that without going through, without asking anyone for, for any permission. That is a fantastic enabler for repurposing commercial properties into other commercial usages. So we are seeing a lot of shops shut down. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, zombie stores. We're seeing a lot of business models that have failed. But we're also, what, what, what we're not seeing is the new stores that are opening. Um, and what it's about, is about understanding who is opening. Um, because you tend to find that strong businesses with strong business models uh, look to open and expand in a recessionary time. Uh, Lidl are looking for um, 50 stores across the UK right now. They're looking to go for the sort of Tesco Metro convenience format. And, you know, if you've got a site which is three and a half thousand square foot with a decent size of footfall, uh, they'll be interested in it. And with the new usage class E, there's plenty more opportunity to repurpose um, a wide range of buildings so that they would be suitable for a, um, a little type store. Domino uh, Pizzas are uh, expanding. They're looking for 50 odd stores. Screwfix are looking to expand as well. So a tool station. There are a bunch of different uh, outlets that actually find that in a recession, it actually makes sense to expand their operations. It makes sense because basically um, outlets are easier to find than in a boom time. And the new um, super usage class E now gives uh, property owners far more flexibility in actually getting someone in. In the old days, it used to be a right old palaver. Um, uh, even if you wanted to change from A1 to something like A2, you'd have to go through full planning permission, which, which often is refused. What would happen is that if you have a tenant, uh, most tenants don't want to go through the convoluted process of planning. They would rather, unless the site is particularly special, they would rather wait or find a suitable site that already has that planning usage class for what they want to do with it. But now, of course, that's all changed from, uh, from 1st of September and has made it in, um, incredibly um, um, easy, if you like, for people to repurpose. Um, so I, I think the important thing is to always look behind the headlines. Uh, and don't look at the doors that are closing. Look at the doors that are opening. And in, uh, there are areas, of course, in the UK which have problems. Um, now, I wouldn't be expecting to find a retail tenant in Blackpool. Uh, there are some areas where <clears throat> the the, the local economy, the population, everything is on a bit of a downward spiral. Um, <clears throat> but of a rough rule of thumb, I link a lot of um, retail and commercial building prosperity, if you like, to um, the average house price in the catchment area. If you're in an area where the, where the average house price is at or above the UK average, then you will find that there will be opportunity or there will be potential to repurpose commercial units to other commercial usages. Uh, in areas where the average house price is significantly lower than the national average, uh, those are in places which have considerable economic problems and therefore they are, it's just too difficult really. There are just too many sites available. Supply demand is just going completely the wrong way. But what I've seen um, in recent months, and I've got a video coming out in a couple of days time on YouTube where I talk specifically about this and showing some uh, uh, sites, some retail sites, which have actually been let uh, in the last couple of months. 
and what sort of uses those are being put to. Uh, so um, Class E has become a phenomenal enabler for all of us doing this sort of thing. But I wanted to um, uh, also talk about offices as well. Um, uh, we run a serviced office uh, centre up in St Albans and I think that um, uh, obviously offices are going through a dramatic change in the way people use them but the particular place that's affected are city centres such as London. Uh, the main reason they're affected is because there's a massive resistance to commute and use public transport to go down um, into a city centre office. What we are seeing emerge is what they call a hub and spoke model, whereby um, large businesses are deciding to contract their central London HQ. They're making it smaller <clears throat> and they're introducing um, spoke offices in the commuter towns. Now, it's all very well when people talk about working from home, um, but working from home is not really a possibility for a lot of people. Um, it's fine if you have a spare bedroom, a dining room, um, a home office at the back of the garden or something like that. But what happens if you're in a two bedroom flat with an open plan kitchen lounge and two toddlers? Working from home is not really a viable option for, for many, many people. So what we are seeing a massive demand for is uh, flexible office space, hot desks and suites um, and service desks, serviced offices and the like, but in commuter towns. So these are commuter towns where people actually live. Instead of take, going, taking the train and going into the big smoke, um, they don't want to necessarily work from home, but they want an office location that's close to um, where they are. So we've seen a massive, massive growth in interest in our, uh, we've actually completed our serviced office centre, it's about 10,500 square foot, just a couple of weeks before lockdown. Uh, but since lockdown was eased, the inquiries have um, literally gone through the roof. We're getting three or four inquiries every single day from people wanting flexible office space uh, and people also wanting to get out of their homes um, and work from a business centre. So there's water cooler chit chat uh, with, with other people and networking opportunities and the like, but without the need to travel into the big spoke. So <clears throat> we, uh, in, particularly in commuter towns, you're going to see a massive growth uh, in serviced offices and flexible office, uh, office environments. But also, I think we're going to see um, a number of former retail stores converted into flexible working and hot desk environment as well. And the, the, the new sort of um, PD and all of that has made that far easier to do, to convert a basically a retail premises into um, an office environment that can, can all be done now uh, without going through convoluted permissions. Um, so I, I think the, the, uh, the, there are too many retail outlets and office outlets right now. Um, and particularly in the fringe locations, uh, repurposing is a must. And I think it's a golden opportunity for the small time developer. In many times in um, history, if you like, uh, commercial buildings only exist for commerce and commercial buildings become defunct. Um, they become no longer fit for purpose. Um, if you think about all the uh, commercial buildings that existed alongside canals, when the railways came in, they became defunct. Um, when the, in 1980s, when manufacturing shifted abroad, uh, so many factories in the UK became redundant and had to be repurposed. But the thing about those repurposings were that it was really large developers who could capitalize on them. If you're, rep if you're repurposing or converting a 20,000 square foot factory somewhere into flats, then that's a larger developer that's taking that on. What's happening now is we're seeing a lot of smaller buildings uh, under 3,000 square foot, um, which are now becoming um, defunct. Uh, so we're seeing shops. If you think about betting shops, for example, uh, more than 60% of betting shops are going to be unviable uh, over the next couple of years because of some changes to the betting rules that um, uh, limit the amount of fixed, fixed odd betting terminals they can have in the, in the shops. So that's going to mean that a huge amount of those are going to shut down. And obviously betting has moved online and there are a whole bunch of other trends there as well. 
But if you think of the average betting shop in a secondary parade, it's typically a small shop. It's not a big Debenhams or something like that. It's a small shop with a couple of floors above. Under permitted development, you can make three flats out of that. You can make a, you can maintain a small retail unit uh, on the ground floor. You can make a flat at the back and, and you can do a couple of flats above. Now, um, that sort of project is simply not attractive to a big, big developer. Um, it's too small beer. Uh, but what it is, is very attractive to a smaller developer. And I think the um, PD changes, um, particularly the Class O, um, the Class M, the Class G, which are already on the table, are fantastic for smaller scale developers. Uh, because what we have seen in the UK is uh, really the death of the, um, the demise of the small scale developer. 40 years ago, 30% of all new dwellings that were brought in, uh, that, that were built, were built by small scale developers. Um, now we have a situation where less than 12% of new dwellings are supplied by small scale developers. Now I believe that's to do with planning uncertainty. Where there's planning uncertainty, uh, you have financing uncertainty and projects are more difficult to finance. Uh, with PD, um, particularly the ones which have the deemed consent, uh, you have much more certainty. Uh, if you follow a basically a tick list, uh, you, you do a little bit of a feasibility, you involve a planning consultant and the like, you can pretty much um, uh, be sure that you will get um, you, 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 you will get your prior approval, you will be able to do it under permitted development. Now this is particularly true um, for the existing PD rights, Class O, Class G, Class M, um, mainly because uh, obviously Class M and Class O have deemed consent, um, Class G you don't actually have to sort of formally apply for, and those sort of things are so checklisted that as long as you, you follow the checklist, um, you know you're going to get it. The newer PD rights, they do have an element of um, viewpoints, if you like, which the planning department can take. So there's a I feel that in the newer PD rights, um, there are, there's a little bit more uncertainty, um, whereas the existing ones that came in in 2013 are far more surefire. And they are far more aimed at, um, apart from Class O, of course, uh, aimed at smaller developers because they're smaller sites. And they give smaller developers that certainty to kind of go ahead, which I think is, 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 is very, very powerful uh, because larger developers simply won't be interested in those sort of projects. Um, how long have I got? Uh, I wanted to show a couple of examples actually, because I'm not really yeah. sure how much got time five, I've got. Yeah. Go on. Five more minutes, yes. Five more minutes, okay. What I'll do is I will, I'm doing a webinar on Sunday, which I'll go into a lot more detail, but I wanted to kind of show this um, um, little graph of my property investing career. Um, now, what the red line shows is the long term average house price in the UK, um, which has roughly followed this sort of straight line. Um, but the thing is, the average is just the average. The market doesn't move like that. It's cyclic. And the blue line shows the market cycle against the long-term average. And what we find is that there are periods of the cycle where the average property price is below the long-term average. And there are periods in the cycle where property prices are above the long-term average. And so I started investing in 1990, which was a great, great time. Property prices were significantly below the long-term average. Um, and in, in 2009 as well, post the credit crunch. Uh, and now we're entering into a similar, similar opportunity. Um, we've got a bit of a strange market right now because I like to think of it as, I mean, we are in a recession. We all know we're in a recession. It's a massive recession in terms of numbers. Um, the GDP is down 20%. But the government have pumped in so much red bull into the economy that everyone's pumping around with wide eyes and uh, can't go to sleep. Um, but that Red Bull will wear off uh, and it will wear off towards the end of the year and uh, coming into next year when furlough schemes start to wind down and bounce back loans need to be repaid and things like government grants start to be used up. Um, so these, this, it, will, it will kick in. And um, 
what we start, and the stamp duty, of course, holiday starts to expire. So what we're going into is basically a repeat of the 2009 um, era. In 2009, the government pumped in so much money into the economy through co quantitative easing. They pumped, they pumped in 300 billion pound um, worth of money into the economy. And what happened in 2009 is it didn't really result in inflation like Zimbabwe, price of bread going up and all of that. And that was because all the major countries uh, pumped in money together. So the, the, the inflation was kind of relative. But where it hits, not really in price of bread and all of that, but where it hits is in asset prices. It creates an asset price bubble. And what happened was, as soon as the economy became, began to recover and the job market uh, got to recover, when we got into 2013, 2014 and beyond, you started seeing the effects of all that quantitative easing in, in asset prices, in asset price inflation, which created a massive boom. This time round, the government has put in 900 billion pound into the economy through quantitative easing, money printing, uh, to, to deal with COVID. So that's three times more than last time. Again, all the major countries have done the same. So it's all relative, they're all relative to each other. So it doesn't necessarily mean the price of bread is going to go up in the supermarket and we're all going to be Venezuela. But what it does mean is that when the job market starts to bounce back and the economy starts to bounce back in a significant way, that quantitative easing money has to go somewhere and it always goes into what's finite. And one thing that's finite is land and, and, and property. And it, it will result in a asset bubble. So there's a golden opportunity really now to um, start to dive in. Um, because the great thing about commercial property and converting commercial property, say, to residential use, typically commercial property is valued far less than residential property per square foot. And in a recession, commercial property values fall further than their residential counterparts. Um, simply because commercial property doesn't really have a bricks and mortar value. It's dependent on who, what commercial occupier you can get to occupy the property and how much rent they can pay. So if businesses are suffering, if businesses aren't renting so many commercial properties, there's a supply and demand in, imbalance and commercial values fall per square foot. So you've got that trend that always plays out in a recession. But what's new this time round is that we've got more opportunities to repurpose those commercial buildings to residential use than we've ever had before. So by simply taking low value commercial property per square foot, repurposing it to residential, uh, you immediately get an uplift, even if the market isn't doing anything. A um, couple of uh, little examples of uh, stuff that I did last time round. Uh, this is a building in uh, North London. It's a, it's a block of uh, three buildings, again, uh, it was the same sort of uh, recessionary time, that time, commercial buildings, unused, difficult to get commercial tenants for. Um, this was repurposed into multiple flats above. Uh, and again, it was this point of, even though it was a recession, it was targeting who is expanding at that time. Because companies with good business models look to expand in a recession. And at that time, people like Greg's, they were looking to add one store a week. Um, Costa we're expanding to. So it's targeting the people that are expand. It's forgetting about the people that are shutting down. It's looking at where the doors are starting to open and who's looking for new sites. And uh, flats were created um, above and the like. But it's, 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 the complete, it's the complete thing of, um, in a recession, what you're looking to do with commercial property is repurpose it. Repurpose some of it to residential use, some of it to commercial use, and get it cash flowing. The minute you get it cash flowing, you can refinance, pull out as near to all of your money as possible, and then go again. And do that as many times as you can uh, during this uh, golden period. I know I haven't got much time. Yeah, great, um, yeah, great, great, yes, I think we, we just about get to, um, um, yeah, if you just wrap up so that we can deal with Andrew and, and set him free. To, uh, to okay, going. I'll just share with um, you a recent deal which was done by one of my students and uh, oops oh, this is quite interesting um, this was at a recent um, Allsop sell it's interesting because it shows the uh, aspect of creativity when applying PD to a site and um, 
This is a, um, a shop with uppers. And the unique thing about this is that um, you're, you're looking at the entrance on one street, but the rear of it is double fronted, basically. It has a double entrance. The rear of this shop is actually another street, and it has another shop front at the back. Um, so what was uh, done here, and, and I don't think people spotted this opportunity, what was done he here was to take this building and first of all convert or split uh, the shop into two units. Uh, so you've got one shop having an address on one street and the other shop having the, an address on the rear. Um, by splitting that shop into two, uh, what that meant is that there were two lots of um, permitted development rights for class G. Class G allows you to put two flats above each uh, shop. Um, so uh, because of that, this opportunity, which just at the moment looks like um, one shop with a couple of upper floors, turned into a split into two shops and making four flats above all under PD. So a lot of this is, is knowing um, the PD rules and knowing how to cut them and slice them and dice them and how to um, sometimes different PD rules work on different, on, on the same site. And it's about um, maximizing the use of them on a particular site. Uh, so I haven't got much time, but I am doing a webinar this Sunday, um, a full 90 minutes with a lot more case studies and you can get on it. It's free Sunday, 7 p.m. Uh, succeedingproperty.com forward slash Midas if you want to join us on that evening.